Um, this is going to be a virtual talk, so we're going to have Dan come up on the stage. Um, I don't think Dan needs an uh, introduction. Who here has heard of Dan before? Dan, the room is up with arms. Everybody knows about you because you're amazing. You have a lot of good thoughts and things written all over the internet. Um, let's hear Dan North. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, very nearly good afternoon. Um, and I'm aware that I'm between you all and lunch. So uh, hopefully this is all working virtually. I'm really, really sad that I'm not in Budapest with you. Craft is absolutely one of my favorite events. Um, and I think I've spoken at all but one of them. Uh, this is my second time virtually. So without any further ado, I want to talk about the most dangerous phrase. I am hoping this is this is a um, a high risk talk. So um, what I mean by that is I'm expecting to get a lot of stick for this. I want to challenge you a little bit today. Um, I want to, uh, in particular, I want to be, I make you aware that this is not a technical talk. This is a thinking talk that may contain some technology. Okay, so this is a talk about thinking. Um, there's a, a lovely anthropologist called Margaret Mead, who, when she was talking about educating children, she said, I want to teach them how to think, not what to think. So today I want to look at how to think rather than what to think. Um, so with that said, why do we do what we do? So why do we do the things we do, the things we do day to day in our work? What, what causes us to choose particular one particular technique over another or one particular tool over another? A lot of it's out of habit. We do this just because we do it, right? So um, it's the thing I always lean, reach for. Um, there, there's this lovely phrase, it's obviously right. Obviously right means I've decided it's right and I've stopped wondering why it's right. It might, I might have stopped wondering why it's right because there's so much else going on in my world, in my life. I don't have time to question everything I'm doing, otherwise I'd never get out of bed. Um, I was asking on the internet about the origin of the phrase, uh, the team is the unit of delivery. And someone came back and said, well, I don't know where the origin is, but it's so obviously true that it must have been loads of people said it. And I said, well, yeah, except I don't agree with that. I don't agree that the team is the unit of delivery. And, and this is what I mean. When, when we say things are obviously right, we've maybe forgotten to stop challenging them. I often I do something because it's the way I was taught. It's the way I saw it. It's what someone showed me. I was pairing with someone one day, and I saw this thing, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And I picked it up. Um, a lot of what we do, we do because everyone else does it. Um, a lot of that's job security, right? Why am I building this, app, this web app in React when React is such a mentally complicated beast because everyone else is, or Angular, or you know, another, web, another JavaScript web technology with 300 dependencies. Why am I doing that? Because that's just what we do these days, OK? Um, and then I'm reminded of the phrase that my mother and probably lots of other people's mothers have said to them over the years, if all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you follow? And I think I probably would have. Um, so everyone else does it this way. And the other, the other reason we do things is because we've always done it like this. Why change things? One of my absolute heroes um, is Admiral Grace Hopper. Uh, Grace Murray Hopper, she, as well as being an admiral in the US uh, military, uh, as a woman, which is an enormous achievement in its own right, um, during wartime, uh, she also invented the compiler. She's one of the absolute pioneers of computing. And she did not take prisoners. She was amazing, this woman. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes of hers, which is basically I've built this talk around, is this. She says, the most dangerous phrase you can use is we've always done it that way. And she's actually talking about what, what at that time she called DP managers, so data processing managers. But we've always done it that way. We've always done it that way, shuts off thought, shuts off innovation, shuts off uh, adopting new ideas. So and sometimes we've always done it that way because it works, because it makes sense, in which case let's carry on doing it that way. Some ideas really do age well. Unix in its many forms, as most of these days Linux, or it might be some free BSD, or if you're running a Mac, that's it, that's based on a Unix. 
Um, if you're running Windows 11, uh, that's got Unix built in as well now. Unix, Unix is everywhere. It's 50 odd years old. I know that because I'm 50 odd years old and I'm about the same age as Unix. Um, and it's still going, it's still going strong. It's changed a bit over the years. Kind of the, the some of the, there's, there's some new things have happened and some old things have fallen off, but that's just how things evolve over time. Um, and again, that's the goal, theory of constraints, flow-based delivery. Uh, his wonderful, wonderful uh, parable story uh, takes place in a factory where a, a chap called Alex is, is running this factory that's making stuff. But all those ideas apply directly into digital product development as well. So Donald Reinertsen with uh, Principles of Product Development Flow brought those ideas directly into, into our product world. Um, some not so much. And I want to look at a couple of those uh, this afternoon. And I'm expecting, I'm expecting a few raised eyebrows. Solid. So these five principles from, from uh, Robert Martin from Clean Code. I'm going to suggest that maybe they haven't aged so well. And the other thing I want to take a pop at is Scrum, which again, I think is, is, is just made, it should have been put out to pasture some time ago. Uh, is this just Daniel hating on things? No, this is, again, I'm trying to teach you how to think, not what to think, and to challenge some things. What do I mean by aging well? Well, as I was putting this talk together, and this was a very challenging talk to put together, I really, really wanted to get this right. And as huge amount of thinking that's gone into trying to make this useful and effective. Let's see if it, if it works. What I realized when I was writing this is it feels like a counterpoint to or a, a follow on from a talk I gave a while back uh, called How to Break the Rules based on Ellie Goldratt's uh, Beyond the Goal series of lectures. So he writes the goal in like 1984 or something. Um, 20 odd years later, he then does a series of lectures beyond the goal, what I've learned in the quarter century since the goal was published. And he has this one core idea that he goes to again and again. And he says, technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. I'll say that again. Technology can bring benefits if and only if it diminishes a limitation. And then he takes a whole load of technology examples and explains what the thing is. Well, he, he, he asks these four questions. So the first thing is, what's the power of the technology? <clears throat> That's pretty easy. Just read the marketing slides, right? They'll tell you the power of the technology, what they're trying to sell you. Really importantly, what limitation does the technology diminish? What thing does it make easier or better or cheaper? What does it allow you to do that you couldn't do before? And then in order to really exploit a technology, and this is his kind of thesis, he says there are a bunch of rules that enabled us to manage not having this thing. And if we don't understand what those rules were, we'll leave them in place and we won't get any benefit from the technology. And finally, he says, what new rules are we going to need based on the new technology? So <clears throat> there's a number of iterations of this talk around. Um, I'll, I'll link to them in Hopin. But basically, it's, uh, it's called How to Break the Rules. And it's it, you know, I, I would very, very much recommend listening to the Beyond the Goal uh, lectures. They're amazing. So I kind of wanted to rip on that. I still want to think about what's the power of the technology. So you know, what is the thing? Um, but then I want to look at some different things. I want to say what constraints inspired it, right? Ne necessity is the mother of invention. What, what necessitated that technology, that innovation? Because now we can start to ask questions. We can say things like what's changed since then, OK? What's changed since? And now we know that, we can say, what should we be doing instead? And if the answer is the same thing, brilliant. But now we're doing it deliberately rather than kind of just by habit um, or by inertia. So let's take a look at this. Well, let me say which constraints inspired the innovation. We need to understand context. Okay, We need to understand what was going on at the time. And the best way to understand what was going on at the time is talk to old people, OK? Talk to old people. They were there. Um, and just to help you, I am old people. So you can come and talk to me as well, right? One of my absolute favorite human beings, uh, Linda Rising, Dr. Linda Rising, um, is now in her 80s. She describes me as young people, which I find utterly delightful. Um, 
I admitted to most of the people in the room, I'm old people, so come and talk to me. The thing, you know, this isn't gatekeeping. This isn't only old people know stuff. It is, we're trying to get closer to the source, okay? Things emerge. Let's find out why things emerge by talking to people who were there when they emerged. So I want to get closer to the source. A couple of caveats. Old people have different stories. Every single person, even two people who were in the same room at the same idea with the same innovation happened, will have different recollections of why or what led to it or what it was trying to do or what it should have done or what a better name for it would have been. Old people have different stories and don't believe then any single source, including me, right? So I'm gonna I, I want to talk to you about challenging what you hear. I want you to challenge what you're hearing while I challenge what you hear. Okay, if it all gets a bit meta. Right. Let's get some work done. Let's take a look at some of these things. I maintain that the advice in clean code, a lot of the advice in clean code has not aged well. One of the core concepts in clean code, um, Robert Martin's book from 2008, I want to say, um, is these five principles. There's actually many, many, many principles, but the, there's five, the top five make a handy acronym. Uh, Michael Feathers observed that this is not the acronym, uh, SOLID. So we have single responsibility principle, open close principle, list of substitutability principle, which is the easiest one to say, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. I want to just pick a couple of those today. We won't have enough time to go through all of them. Um, just to unpack them. And what I want to do is I want to start by saying what a brilliant idea they were which some people might find surprising. Let's take a look at SRP then. So a single responsibility principle says this. It says a class should have only one reason to change. And Robert Martin later on in um, very, very Clean Architecture, which is like a, a sequel to Clean Code, he says, actually, people really struggle with the idea of reason. What is a reason to change? So it should only serve one actor, OK? So a class should only serve one actor. And he gives examples. Um, he says, he says get together things that change for the same reasons and separate things that change for different reasons. And you think, makes sense. That seems pretty reasonable. OK. He says, the role of an accountant is different from a database administrator. And at this point, I'm kind of, I don't know, my spidey senses are tingling a little bit. I say that the role of an accountant is, is different from uh, a salesperson or a, um, a doctor, or someone else who might use software. But a DBA is a really interesting thing to, to say what the role is different. Because a DBA is on the supply side of an application, not the demand side of an application, right? So a DBA is someone who helps me build and run an application, not someone who, who, who I built it for, yeah? So that's an interesting juxtaposition. There's then this quote um, in his original 2014 article, um, and I'm going to kind of go through it in full. It's quite long, but I think it's really, it tells you some useful stuff. He says, this is the reason we do not put SQL into JSPs. JSP is for anyone under 40 in the room. Uh, Java server pages is kind of like PHP for Java. So you could have HTML with some Java in it, and that whole thing would get pre-processed and compiled into a Java servlet, which would basically do calculations and emit HTML. What he's saying is don't put, don't put SQL in there. Don't, don't have JSPs talking directly to a database. That's crazy talk. He says, this is the reason we don't generate HTML in the modules that compute results. I'm just going to say as a side note, a JSP is literally something that generates HTML in a module that computes results. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure why that's there. But anyway, this is the reason that business rules should not know the database schema. That's his thesis, right? He says, business rules should be separate from database schema. Generating HTML should be different from computing results. Um, east is east, west is west, dogs and cats should not lie down together. And he says, this is about separating concerns. And we go, okay, let's take a look at an example. If you're not enormously technical, this doesn't get enormously technical. Here's some code. It's in a file. And it's probably Java code because clean code was written mostly about Java and C code. And we can see what it does. It's called print report. It gets data. 
using get data and assigns that to something called data. It does a calculation on the data, do calc, and assigns that to something called calc. And then finally, it renders, it passes the calc into something that does rendering. So SLP says, well, getting data, doing a calculation, the business rules, and rendering a calculation, they're separate things, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to explode them out, and they're going to live in separate places, so separate source files. And you know, a naive read of this would be like, why? Why did you just make work hard for yourself? Why did you just go and create admin, right? And again, talk to old people who were there. And what I remember is this. All those jobs back in the day were done by different people. So the data people, you, you didn't, as a developer, you, you didn't dare touch the database. Uh, um, you wouldn't go near the database. In fact, you weren't allowed. Now, you would submit a request, a ticket to the DBA team. And at some point in the future, one of the DBAs would deign to tell you what was wrong with your ticket. Or possibly you might end up with, um, uh, with a database change, right? But that was a huge onerous process. And you had to really, really want to change the database. And, and part of the, um, the, the skill, if you like, of being a successful engineer in the 90s was being, was having a friend who was a DBA, making friends with the DBA team to just open doors. Meanwhile, you know, do count. The business teams would be writing business software, and all they were doing was algorithms, all they were doing was data processing. And then right there, you know, that you'd have some designer, and the designer would do all the UI work. And this is when we had big, thick, rich UIs. Even when the web came along, we still very much had like front end and back end. My, my little doggy. who's off camera there, is determined to come in this room and was going to continue scratching at the door until I let her. Let's see how long she lasts until she wants to leave the room. So this is where we were. And when you understand that the world was like this, it would have been insane not to throw this out into three different areas. Because don't forget, we had really poor version control. At best, it was file-based, right? So in other words, if I changed five files, there was nothing connecting those five. You know, there was no, no, we didn't have any atomic commits in our in, in our in our version control systems. That came much later with things like um, subversion and perforce. Well, at the time, we had CVS, we had SCCS, we had RCS, we had a bunch of other acronyms that your grandparents can tell you about. And so, uh, changing files was a risky business. Having people in different teams, often different departments, maybe different buildings, right? Um, trumping around in the same file was crazy talk. And so single responsibility principle makes a lot of sense. But now let's roll the clock forward, okay? Let's have a, a, a um, stop motion of the next 20 years. And this happens. We bring all these people together into the same teams. We call them cross-functional teams or, or poly-skilled teams. And now these cross-functional folks are all sitting together was still working on different things by and large and so it kind of still sort of makes sense and then what happens is this we start to glom them together into what we call a full stack engineer um but the idea is the culture was that everything is code so what you what a database change used to be a super high risk thing that only the wizards of databaseness were allowed to go near and then around about sort of early 2000s Folks like Sam Newman, who we saw this morning, um, and promote Satellite and some just really, really smart people. Well, we're thinking of the database changes as code. And so we had, they, they invented this idea of a migration. And a migration was a little script that would tell a database how to change. And the really small migration tools like DB Deploy, which is the forerunner of, of Flywheel and a whole bunch of other things, and Rails migrations would have a metadata table in the database saying which change scripts, which migrations had been run in. So you couldn't get them out of sequence. It was idempotent. It was brilliant. And so now suddenly database changes were just code changes. you know. And so the same people could do this. In fact, Ruby on Rails became enormously successful because it said, if you know Ruby, you can do Ruby in the UI with the RB. You can do Ruby in the, in the app. As, as your programming logic, and you can do Ruby for the database because it's just Ruby migrations. 
JS has done a similar thing. And so now what happens is this, a change comes in. Can you add a field, please? Well, yeah, of course I can add a field to this report. Ah, right, and that's going to hit the database because I need to make a schema change to add the field. And I need to populate it and maybe back populate it. Um, I then, of course, have to change the calculation because I need to now in incorporate this field. It might be a separate thing. It might be part of some other calculation. And then I have to render it. So guess what? I've got to go touch all these things. But I don't really know a way around all these things. Can we change the precision on a field? Oh, that's easy. That's just a rendering thing. No. No, it's not. Anyone here who's done any maths at all or any financial calculations at all, the way you add precision to a result is to add the corresponding precision to every single input to that result, which may be higher, right? Because it may be that you're going to lose some precision in the calculation. So changing the precision is possibly a data change, right? I need to store a higher resolution number or set of numbers in my database. It's absolutely a calculation change. It's definitely a rendering change. So what happens is any non-trivial change ends up touching everything anyway, right? And we're going, oh. And again, back in the day, add a field or change the precision would never have got to the developer. It would have got to some much, much higher level, big upfront thing, been exploded into the part with the database, the part with the calculation, the part with the rendering. And each of those would have been packaged up and sent off to the separate teams. And then someone would have done the packaging at the end, and we call that integration, and it really, really hurt. And we'd maybe go around that a few times because we're getting it wrong. And that's what it looked, that's what out of field looked like. I was writing enterprise Java code in the early 90s, and out of field was get set, 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 read. Right? That's what it was. You had the database, you had a, a DAO, data access object, a DTO, data transfer object. You then had a servlet, you then had a JSP, which was a server page. You then had, ah, oh, right? So, and all of that, and behind the scenes in these, you've got a bunch of helper objects as well that are doing the actual work. And everything was just handing off and handing off and handing off. So our field was, was basically admin. So in that, in that world, it made a lot of sense, right, to separate these things out. We're not in that world. And the logical conclusion then of something like this is Ruby on Rails kind of skeleton project, right, separation of concerns, where you have everything in its own little subfolder and sub subfolders, and this is abridged, right? This is, there are 50, 60 separate things from a blank skeleton project in modern rails. It's mind boggling, the stuff you have to know to get started. So this got me scratching my head as well. I'm like, we're not idiots, right? We're quite good at this. So, so what's going on there? And I thought, I'm going to go and look at this separation of concerns thing, because in Robert Martin's article, it's his original, um, or not original, but in his, in his 2014 blog post where, where he talks about um, SRP, he says he's got two kind of real inspirations for this. One is Edgar Dijkstra talking about On the Role of Scientific Thought, which is a 1974 article. Um, and the other is David Parnas. Um, and again, you know, two massive, massive thinkers in our, in, in our world and, and very much brilliant ideas. And if you go and read On the Role of Scientific Thought, it's a very, very thought-provoking and brilliant piece of writing. And I learned something. I know that I've been getting separation of concerns from role, and I've been doing this for 30 years, and I'm going to guess that most people in the room are going to get this wrong as well. Um, I'm going to need my MC to help me here because I can't see, but I'm just going to ask you to put your hands up if you think reading from the database and rendering values on a screen are separate concerns. Put your hand up if you think that's true. Okay, I'm going to ask you if you think um, a feature that calculates a mortgage and a feature that uh, sends out a marketing email um, to my customer base are separate concerns. Do you think those are separate concerns? Put your hands up if you think those are separate concerns. So we have okay. most of the room here raising their hands. Yes. I'm assuming, <laughs> I am going to you, I'm assuming that most people raise their hands both times. 
Yeah, There's some nods roll. here. Yes, yes, some nods. Roll and roll. Sorry, folks. That's not what Dijkstra means by concerns at all. <laughs> what he says is this. We need to balance a number of concerns about a program, such as correctness versus performance. Right? That's what he's talking about. Does it work versus is it fast? Right? Those are concerns. Right? They're not about features or layers or any of that nonsense. They are about aspects of the code, the program. Is the application correct? Is the application fast? Right? So he says this, which is really telling. Separation of concerns is about being one and multiple track minded simultaneously. In other words, what he's warning you or encouraging you is while you're thinking about you primarily focused on the correctness of the code, also be mindful of its performance. Right? We can make it faster later. You know, make it <laughs> what is it? Make, make it right, make it beautiful, make it fast, right? So we can come to performance later, but be mindful, be multi-track when you're doing that. And he then says this, and this is again quite a chunky sentence, but I really think I want to drive home what, what separation of concerns is about. He says, the task of making a thing that satisfies our needs. That's basically product software, right? Make a thing that satisfies my needs. Yeah. And he says that is split into two parts. There's the part where you state the properties of a thing that will meet your needs, right? What would meet my needs? And then there's a second part, which is making a thing guaranteed to have those properties, right? So if property is then happy, uh, I can demonstrate properties, therefore happy, right? It's pretty good logic. And what he's saying is that there are two concerns here that are specifying the thing and making the thing. When you're specifying the thing, he says, be mindful of the fact you're going to have to make it. So come up with something that could be made. And when you're making it, be mindful of the fact that you're making a thing to meet needs. Right? Wow. That's pretty deep thinking, right? For, you know, we basically mostly computed at that time are wires being plugged into things and, and very low level languages and Fortran is just being invented. And so, when you say things like this, right, you go, oh, yeah, it makes sense to separate those concerns, definition and construction, or uh, correctness and I mean, one example he really gives, which I love, is correctness versus usefulness. Right? Does it work versus does anyone care? <laughs> wonderful. Talk about product market fit in the 70s. So, and then he says about this making a thing, splitting that into two, what, what are the properties of the thing? Also, interestingly, he doesn't say what are the requirements for the thing, what are the properties of the thing? What properties does it have to make it meet my need? He says business data processing systems, i.e., I'm going to say to the first approximation, everything that everyone in this room is working on, are sufficiently complicated to require such a separation of concerns. You can't describe it and make it at the same time. Or any non-trivial system. That's what he's warning us about. I'm like, I love you, Edgar. This is brilliant. Let's do it. Let's separate concerns. What would separating concerns look like if we actually looked at code? Well, it turned out behavior and code structure are separate concerns, right? What it does and where the code lives are completely independent from each other. Whilst I am working on the behavior, I should be mindful of the code structure. Whilst I am changing the code structure, I should be mindful of behavior. This all makes sense to me. But what if we didn't separate concerns? And I'm saying concerns now in air bunny quotes because they are concerns. They are uh, aspects of writing code, right? Databasey stuff versus view stuff. What if we didn't do that? What if we keep all the code together as long as it fits in my head? And I've been using this pattern name fits in my head for, well, since about 2010, 2011. So well over a decade. And one of the challenges I get with fits in your head is, oh, well, my head's different. I'm saying, no, sure, I'm going to define whose head. <laughs> your head understands the language, you know, the tool chain it's written in, understands idiomatic code in that language, in that ecosystem, and it understands enough about the problem domain. So I'm, that's my table stakes. So you don't, what you don't have is an eidetic memory where you know exactly where every bit of code that was ever written lands in the, in the 
So you need, you're going to need some signposting. Okay. As long as all you need to do to make sense of this is understand the language, the tool chain, the idioms, problem domain. Let's assume that's all you know, and you're building this thing, and you're building this thing. At some point, it stops fitting in your head. Now we need to split it out. Now we need to structure the code. That's a separate concern. And so what does that look like? Well, that looks like this. We move the code to, and I'm going to use that wonderful quote that's in the article, but that no one does, to put together things that change together. Why does no one gather together things that change together? Because they already separated out the data stuff from the calculation stuff, from the view stuff, the models, the controllers. They already separated all that out because SRP told them to, right? So here's what I'm going to assume. And again, I can assume this now because it's likely to be true now. And I can guarantee you it was not true in the late mid-90s, early 2000s, when when when... SRP was proposed and was brilliant, was the right thing to do. I'm going to assume the program is a polyglot. I'm going to assume that my programmer knows enough SQL to get by and has permission and is allowed to go and change the database, right? I'm going to assume that any change affects the whole stack at a field, at change of precision, okay? Um, I have unbelievably good tooling now. Right? I can deterministically roll forward and roll back database schema changes, not just data changes. Right, That's, That did not exist 20 odd years ago. And so what that means is I'm going to end up with completely self-contained, after is included, sub-reports, not report views all bundled together, report models all bundled together, right? in a big bag of other models, in a big bag of other views. That's not how my code is going to look. I have a materially different code structure than someone religiously following SRP because my constraints, I'm using the fact that the constraints have changed. The world has changed. And I'll give you an example of this. HTMX, I'm just in love with HTMX at the moment, mostly because it's just so bonkers, right? It's so bonkers. This is the motivation for HTMX. Um, why should only anchors with hrefs and forms be allowed to make HTTP requests? That's in the HTTP spec, right? I think an anchor or form can make an HTTP request. An anchor can only do a get, and a form can only do a post, right? Why well, should only click and submit events trigger them? Why well, should only get and post be available? And why well, should you only be able to replace the entire page, right? Those seem like arbitrary and unnecessary constraints on HTML, on HTTP as a specification. So HTML said, I'm going to fix that, right? Anything can cause stuff to happen. Um, and so what, what this means is you end up with this bonkers stuff. So you end up with a button where if you click on the button, uh, the HX trigger says, oh, what well, do I get clicked on? I do stuff. Um, and this is the genius thing. It's, uh, it's genius because it's so incredibly stupid and obvious. It is you send HTML over the wire. REST says representational state transfer. Right? You represent the state as a chunk of HTML with the actions you're allowed to perform on it. That comes back, okay? If you are sending fragments of HTML around the place, you don't need a protocol. You don't need a JavaScript framework to make sense of the JSON data structure coming back, right? Because there isn't one. You don't need some JavaScript to render the data into some HTML uh, DOM nodes that you're then gonna ram into the DOM because it just comes, it comes already built, yeah? So you're doing server-side rendering, um, you can use page fragments. So it says, what's the target? The target is the thing with an ID of parent div, and then you're going to swap the outer HTML. So you're going to swap the entire div with whatever comes back. That's it. That's it. It looks a lot like HTTP. It's crazy, right? It's crazy talk. It has its own little language called HyperScript, or what the fiddly bits. Um, but there are some gorgeous stories on um, the essays. With someone from the real React app, um, they went from 255 JavaScript dependencies down to nine, 95% <laughs> reduction. The build time went from 40 seconds down to five seconds. Um, and the code base size went down by two thirds. So it was 20 something thousand lines of code, it went down to 6,000. Okay. So all of this is what Fred Brooks would have called accidental complexity. None of this was adding any value to the app. The app still works the same. He said, if anything, it performs better. It caches better. 
it's more easy to read, it's less buggy. So HTMX is not allowed to exist in an SRP world, right? Because single responsibility says, what do you mean you're on the server, you're rendering HTML with data calculations in it that you're getting from a database. That's crazy talk, you, you mad thing. No, we separate the concerns and we have React or Angular or whatever this week's crazy, massively complicated web framework is, and a whole set of new tools and baking and whatever else, and then tools to manage tools. We have all of that because separation. And it turns out Ecodyxtra never meant that in the first place. Right? Wow. Let that, let that just settle for a minute. The most dangerous phrase you can use is we've always done it that way. Okay. Moving on, I'm running out of time. Open class principle, I want to take a quick look at. And that class should be open for extension and close for modification. Um, says, uh, uh, says from Maya uh, back in the whenever it was, 80s, I guess. And it answers the question, but what happens if? Right? What happens if we add a new case? What happens if we change this code? What happens if? It's all speculative, right? Hypothetical. Files should be open for extension, closed for modification. I'll explain what that means in a minute. When we first proposed it, uh, Bertram and I was talking about using abstract classes. And the idea was that you, if you had an abstract class, it had really clear extension points. Right? You didn't change the class. It's closed for modification, but it's open for extension. You could subclass it. You could subclass, you could extend your abstract class and make it do new things. And the point of open closed principle was to say, here are the places you can change, you can extend to make it do new things. These pieces are all out of bounds. You don't get to touch those. Um, so what was true? What was true at the time? Old people, right? The source code was an asset. So what that meant was this, um, and this was being the C++ world, we were going to sell libraries of source code to do a thing. Right? You'd buy a healthcare source code, you know, a healthcare library, it was all copyrighted up the wazoo, um, or finance um, source code. And the idea was then that you would then build your financial app or your healthcare app off the back of this, someone else has done all the heavy lifting for you, right? And so you needed clear extension points. This made a lot of sense, right? You absolutely don't want your customers messing up the internals of these abstract classes, touching them in any way, but we can't sell them shrink wrap. We can't sell them immutable because just that's how languages work, right? I can't give you source code and make it that you can't touch the source code. Well, if we didn't have the, the technology then, we, we hadn't thought we hadn't solved that problem. So the way we did it was in a massively deep legal document that said, don't you dare, okay? So the customer wouldn't mess up the internals. And also, don't forget, this is again in the 90s, changing code was terrifying, right? Going into any code base, yeah, any non-trivial code base. We had really poor tooling for what you know, code changes. Nothing really was deterministic. You could spend, you know, if you, you could spend, and I this happened, a you know, real example, 12 weeks to make a change, 10 weeks uh, to do the impact analysis of that change. If I make this change, what could possibly go wrong? And how can I mitigate and demonstrate that I'm mitigating every possible bad thing? I need to make the change. Just change, right? Two weeks of regression testing to make sure that I've gone through absolutely everything on that impact analysis. Yeah. And that was a change. A one day change would take easily 12 weeks. Well, you know, for good reasons, right? We were terrified of not doing it like that. So then what happened? Well, in basically three things happened in rapid succession. In 1999, Martin Fowler publishes uh, Refactoring. Now he's written a lot, right? He's written a lot of stuff and he says, this is the work he's most proud of because this is the work that's had the biggest impact on our industry, and I agree. Refactoring was this. It, it made the statement we can make um, deterministic changes to code, but then it gave us a pattern language right, to do that with. Uh, Ken Beck publishes Extreme Programming Explained, which is basically an experience report of a project where Martin was on the team and they're building an internal finance system for Chrysler. And he introduces all these brilliant, crazy technical practices like working in pairs to solve a puzzle, like integrating code every day instead of once at the end of the project and 
being terrified of it. Uh, like um, shared code ownership, so different than you didn't have Martin's code and Kent's code, you had the code and anyone could basically make changes. Test-driven development, which is a dreadful name for a brilliant idea, which is that you write little code examples to guide your design. All of these things, they already existed, right? But XP Explained kind of brought them together and gave them to the world. Refactoring was so brilliant and so beautifully articulated. I'm a fan of Martin. I've known Martin a long time, and I, I have nothing but respect for his work. And when I go back and revisit it decades later, it just still stands up. Uh, a bunch of Russians who have been working in um, a uh, product called Together Control Center, they took these refactorings and codified them. They said, you don't need to learn the pattern. You learn the pattern language is useful. You don't need to learn the steps. We'll do that. And they built this refactoring IDE. Now, Smalltalk already had a refactoring IDE called Visual Age, uh, which then became Visual Age for Java. But IntelliJ was the one that kind of captured the mind share, and suddenly now we could just change code. And so it means that changing code became easy and deterministic. So the IDE manipulates code through the AST. CD daily code examples act as our first line checking, and then we can have some automated testing for further checking. And then we get this atomic version control. So if I mess it up, it's really easy to back out. I've put a little star next to trivial because obviously we all use Git and it's horrible. Um, but until Pigeon takes over the world, uh, we're stuck with Git and at least backing out changes is possible, right? If you have a friend who understands Git Replog, it makes it a lot easier. Right, I need to speed up. Services are now the asset, right? We don't sell source code. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter when it's extendable or not because no one ever sees it. You integrate with a SaaS through its API. The API is the extension point. There's no abstract class to extend. There's no interfaces to implement. So it becomes redundant, right? All code is both open and closed all the time. Code is malleable now in this world. It's not assembled chunks. Why do we still talk about OCP? Because we've always done it that way. Right, I'll leave the others as an exercise. Um, here's a little meme for you. I hope you enjoy this. Um, what do I do? Oh, no, I'll just use solid. Okay, anyways, let's talk about Scrum. I'm going to do this very briefly. Um, Scrum starts in the early 90s with a single constraint. I say starts with a little star there because there are many origin stories. Okay, most good ideas start in multiple places and then come together and coalesce. Mine starts with this brilliant lady, Martine Devos. Um, this is her. It's my favorite photo of her. She looks like she's about to burst out laughing, which I find it enormously. I try and look at her face without starting to laugh, right? It's really hard to not start to giggle. She's brilliant. So she's working at the Belgian um, education department, so public sector, huge, lumbering, multi year projects. And she's like, I'm done with this. Deliver something in 12 weeks. Um, we'll have a checkpoint at six weeks. We'll sprint to halfway, or I'm just going to start throwing stuff around. And so because of this one constraint, all these novel practices emerge. The sprint itself, the idea of running a mini six-week project is completely unheard of. This multi-year Gantt chart becomes this lightweight sprint plan. We're just going to plan six weeks out, and then we'll plan the next six. The multi-month features that were going from desk to desk to desk to desk and have huge, huge amounts of paperwork and collateral, they become just these tiny little vertical backlog items, right, that we can ship within a, within a sprint. Monthly steering. Well, if I'm running an 18 month project, that's 18 monthly steering meetings. If I've got six weeks, even if I have a meeting every week, I've only got six, I might as well do it every day, right? Suddenly I just invented the stand up, right? So monthly steering becomes a daily scrum. And what used to be a huge heavyweight BRD, which could take months on its own, that's just a backlog of things I'd like. And the backlog might change because I might change the things I'd like because I'm learning, right? Yeah. And all of these handoffs and politics and trying to get someone's manager's manager to get someone else's manager's manager to do work is just a dev team. They're complicated, cross-functional people who work side by side. Incredible. No one can believe what they see. Delivering one a quarter. Right? A 12-week sprint is a quarter. That's a long time. It's a season, right? But in the 90s, that was impossible. You can't do anything in a season. We're talking about two or three years. Rather than just getting the kit is going to take months, right? Provisioning the kit is going to take weeks. Compiling code takes hours. You know, the famous, famous um, uh, XKCD. I just love this, right? This is C++ all over. Or Scala, if you, know, if you write Scala. 
Um, compiling code takes actually deployment takes a really long time. So two of the originators of, of Scrum write the guide. And certification gives you directly an to real practitioners. I want to know that the people I'm hiring have learned from people who do this. <laughs> That's quite a popular business model. So that explodes into like a billion dollar certification industry. I mean, literally billion dollars. It absolutely eclipses all other agile methods. They're still around. You know, people still do XP, talk about XP. Many of the XP practices have become as mainstream as these things get, but man, Scrum's everywhere, right? It's become synonymous with Agile. People talk about Scrum or Agile to mean the same thing. They talk about Scrum Agile, right? And anyone who's been around the manifesto or the authors of the manifesto um, are as hard <laughs> about that. Um, but, you know, it won, right? So what happened since? What happened since? The main thing that happened since is the technical landscape has absolutely changed beyond all recognition. So I've got languages that compile behind my fingers while I'm typing. Java, C Sharp, right? Compiled languages in my IDE. I'm getting real-time squiggles because it's being compiled. That's just like mind-blowing, yeah? Continuous delivery, right? I, I can open source code check into a tested running system in minutes or certainly hours, right? It's a very, very short process and it's fully automated. <laughs> Compute's in the cloud now, yeah? Whether it's on-prem or hybrid or Amazon or whatever. Procurement um, of compute infrastructure is instant. It's a credit card. Procurement of compute infrastructure is seconds or minutes, right? So mind-boggling contraction of timescales. Practically on demand. And now the, the user side of this, the feedback side of this, I can deploy a change to a web app, and the next time you go there, you'll see it. Right? There is no uh, release, there is no uh, distribute, there is no CD in the mail, you know, or attach this disk. Um, in apps, and we know that mobile apps, um, there's certainly barriers to deployment around App Store and App Store approval and whatever else. But even there, we've got things like Test Flight, we've got Google Play Console, where I can drop versions of an app, beta versions of an app, very, very quickly and inexpensively to a small audience. So now I've got really fast user feedback. So what does that mean? Well, Scrum, it turns out, doesn't make things faster, right? Scrum makes things tend to a particular maximum, right? It moves the game from years to months or weeks. The problem is now we can do things in minutes, right? And it makes those months or weeks, yeah? Wow. So while my competitors are making multiple product decisions in a morning, I'm going to have a sprint meeting and a release planning and a sprint planning, and I'm going to do all these ceremonies that Scrum prescribes. And here's a fun thing that I didn't realize until I I read the Scrum Guide. I did a lot of reading of these things, of things I kind of thought I knew, but it turns out I didn't. Um, the Scrum Guide, people, Scrum uh, advocates talk about inspect and adapt, but Scrum says you inspect and adapt. Yes. It's then very specific. It says these words. It says you can inspect the backlog. Right? You inspect the increment, you inspect the product, and you adapt the backlog items. Right? You do not inspect and adapt Scrum. It says explicitly in the, I think it's the 2020 version, the latest version of the Scrum Guide, if you are doing, if you are not doing all of these Scrum events, Scrum artifacts, whatever, you're not doing Scrum. If you are doing anything as well as these artifacts, you're not doing Scrum. Scrum if and only if the Scrum Guide, right? So it is not an adaptive process. It is not an inspection and adapt of the process. Inspect and adapt of the product within very, very strict, articulated, prescribed um, framework, which I found a bit surprising. So here's a modern alternative to Scrum. Um, you can have two planning cadences in my world, quarterly, right? Um, you know, you can turn so you can do quite a lot of damage in a quarter. And right now. Okay, I've learned something right now. The best time to action it is right now, not tomorrow, not next week. No, certainly not in six weeks' time when the sprint ends. Well, what that seems around demand, right? We don't have a standard shape of team. We make the team shape as fluid as the work shape. The core idea in, in lean operations is you move the people to the work. Originally, again, when you look at Scrum, you brought the people to the work. These cross-functional teams were unheard of. But what happened was we baked that. We said the cross-functional team is the clever bit. 
rather than moving the people to the work is the clever bit. The point solution at this point in time happens to be a cross-functional team that looks like this. So we build teams that are as fluid as the demand is dynamic, and we re-team every quarter. If the demand isn't that dynamic, if the demand is reasonably predictable and fixed, the team structure will be reasonably predictable and fixed. That's fine. You don't have to mix everything up, but you have the option. You're creating the option. Some people are in teams in this world, right? They're much more useful moving between teams. Deployment is a technical decision, and release is a commercial one. Okay, so we deploy as often as we like, but behind feature flags or behind some kind of uh, gate, a technical gate, and then making things available. It turns out that's actually been in Scrum for a while. It says, well, so there's a quote that says, do not wait for a sprint boundary to deliver to stakeholders. So you're allowed to do intra sprint delivery. Um, but that's not always been there. And right? that's been added. Which is good. It's good to see. It's, it's, it's kind of trying to adapt, but it's kind of still stuck. And the daily steering is about what's left to do. Right? Are we nearly there yet? Yeah, it's not what did you do yesterday? I don't care what you did yesterday. What I care is what's still done, what's still left to do. Did we have a breakthrough yesterday that means that the stuff we've got left to do is different stuff? Because that's pretty cool. So why do we cling to Scrum and Solid? Well, partly because we've built huge industries around both of them. I mean, of Scrum's dwarfs, Solids, and everyone else's, right? But there's a huge industry, which means there's a huge amount of structural inertia. You can't go to everyone with a Scrum certification and say, look, that stuff, the stuff we're teaching you, made sense 30 years ago. There's a lot of principles underlying that which are much more useful, um, but we don't want to do that because we invalidate our business model. But as you might as well agree, just structural inertia. If your thing is called solid, you can't suddenly make it be about other principles, right? It's the ones that spell S-O-L-I-N-D, yeah? So that's why I've been talking about Cupid and saying that these are characteristics or properties that great joyful code has yeah you get there it's up to you figure out what works figure out what your friends are doing right make their lives joyful too um, i'm absolutely not going to hang my acronym on practices on things you should do good heavens that'd be crazy what's called a commitment or a consistency bias wonderful wonderful book called influence by robert cialdini about how how we um uh, our cognitive biases kind of keep us stuck in certain modes. Uh, consistency bias, I only want to use solid. If I suddenly stop using solid, I'm going to have to say that old me was an idiot. I, I would say that if you still use solid, future you is an idiot. So you can fix that right now. Um, and neither of them really has a mechanism to evolve. They've seen tinkering around the edges. We've seen the language change for SRP, but it's still the same thing. We've seen some tweaking of solid of Scrum. Um, so leader went away, it's now a true leader. I don't know what that even is. Um, sprint commitments became sprint forecast, but basically, you have the same stuff. Um, wonderful, wonderful scene from the life of Brian, uh, where Brian is standing at the window talking to hundreds of people saying, You must think for yourselves. And they go, We're not thinking for ourselves. And one of them says, I don't want this. They say, Shut up. So, what does that mean? Look past the scrum and the solid dogma and all the other dogmas you come across. Assess your own tools and practices. What should you change and what should you move towards? I talk to old people, right? I know old people. I talk to me. Um, find out why we do the things we do and be prepared to challenge them. And a lot of old people love that challenge because they're learning too, right? I'll leave the last word, of course, to uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. The most dangerous phrase you can use is we've always done it that way. Thank you very much. That's all I've got to say. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, certainly a lot to think about. Um, we have not too much time for questions, but please get out your Slido um, if you want your question to be read. Um, Dan, can you see me? Uh, can, can, all right, all right, cool. I just didn't know if, if we were able to see me or not. We're all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got you on my tiny little, uh, tiny little Zoom screen here. I, I can try to be bigger. I can no. read it. I can see you in your hands. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so the first question, um, how would you organize your code that contains model code, business logic, some report sending, and rendering views, um, as opposed to the typical MVC layout? So you mentioned a couple of things there. Great question. Okay, so I, can, I can tell you, I can also point you to something. So when I was writing the Cupid articles, 
Um, well, this is something I really, really wanted to get across. I call this domain, uh, domain specific structure. So um, the D with Cupid is that um, domain awareness, making things domain based. And it's not just in the DDD, you know, domain driven design sense. It's not just about bounded context and using domain language while that's very important. It's also structuring your code in a domain based way. So, for instance, um, at the top of my product, right, at the top of my code base, I won't have models, views, controllers. I'll have patient registration, um, appointment booking, uh, administration, whatever it is, right? And so those will be the high level functional areas of my product because when I want to change it, I'm likely to want to go in and change a particular product area. Within that, there will then be the sub functions of those. So it, my code, my directory structure will look a lot like a DDD domain model. It'll be a, a, the app and then there'll be bounded context and then sub, sub context within those subdomains within those. Within those folders, the actual code I have entirely depends on the constraints of the language, right, or the constraints of the tooling I've got. So something like um, Rails, uh, and actually, you know, I've not touched Rails for well over a decade, so this may not be true, but it didn't used to like you having uh, model view and controller code in the same file, right? It really got upset about that. And a lot of the hot reloading certainly would break if you did that. So it requires you to have things in separate files, but I'll at least have them next to each other. I won't have models here and views here and controls here. I'll have all the models, views, controllers, all the code I need for this bit of functionality will sit in the same place. And then I'll try Gibbo, which is a lot more lenient about this stuff. I'll just start with it all in one file. And as that file gets bigger and bigger and no longer fits in my head, I will then start breaking it out structurally based on the problem I'm solving, not on the horizontal layers, if you like, of my technical solution. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then maybe one last question. Um, have you thought of publishing the counter arguments on Solid Scrum, for example, in a book? Is there like a blog post, a book coming out? What, what, are, you, what are your next steps with this uh, line of thinking? Um, thank you. Yes. Yes. So I don't know if we For me, certainly, it's more like a, a challenge. You know, I want to lay down the challenge. My goal was to. Um, uh, to have written the article, have published something ahead of giving this talk. This is the first time this talk has gone out anywhere. So this started as a, a conversation between myself and Fayo, the kind of the, the founder, if you like, the, the, the godfather of craft, um, about this topic. And I said, I really, really want to talk about this. It's been bubbling away for ages. It's kind of, I allude to it a lot in the, in the Cupid work, but I haven't really kind of unpacked it. And he said, great, can we, talk to, can we talk about it at Craft and publish the article and then we can reference it? Yep, no. That <laughs> <laughs> happened. <laughs> so I haven't done that yet. But my plan is to follow this talk up with exactly that, with an article which is effectively the, the, the blog post of the talk. Beautiful. And if somebody wants to follow along, I see your Twitter handle on the bottom here. I guess that's the best way to kind of follow along with you. Yeah, I'm on the elephants as well. Um, so I'm, 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 I should be hopefully pretty easy to find. Uh, or hit me up on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Twitter, Mastodon. Uh, there aren't many Tastapods around. It's a made-up word. So um, and I'd be delighted to carry on this conversation. Okay, also, sorry, very quickly, there is a Cupid um, uh, groups.io group. So there's a Cupid Joyful Software group. Um, which again, I'll put references to all this in, in the in the hopping channels. Uh, and I'm very very happy to pick up any of these discussions um, on on those on, on the um, uh, on the discussion groups because I, I I love I love unpacking this stuff and then having a threaded discussion is a really great way to capture it. Great. Well, thank you again, Dan North. Um, uh, we will get this to you. Maybe we can focus on this. It's a little keepsake oh. from the craft group. Um, I know you're a veteran to craft, so um, yeah, uh, uh, there we go. Let's compare, let's compare. All right. All right, so you, you get another one, amazing. Th this one without a hat, though. So, so there, you got a little I bit got, of a difference. I, I got one of these, I got a mug, I got a craft mug many years ago. Hey, look, not, not that I keep these things close by, but that's one of them. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. 
All right, thanks again. Um, <laughs>